Take the weight off your slingbacks. <laughs> if Paul O'Grady were here tonight, he'd be up in the cheap seats shouting, get him off. <laughs> I'm going to put my glasses on because I'm so terribly old. <laughs> I think Paul would say, special achievement, fuck off. <laughs> the job's not done till this stinking self-serving shower of a government are Strung up from the nearest lamp. <laughs> Paul was a very loud and large presence in the lives of everyone who knew him, and the silence since he left us has been quite deafening. A phone call from Paul was always quite an event. There would be moaning, gossip, a rant about the Tories or TV executives, or some old bitch in Waitrose who got on his nerves. <laughs> I'd always be left aching with laughter, but always somehow uplifted by his view of the world, because Savage knew the value of words and how to use them, whether that was to be funny, to diffuse a situation, to insult someone, or shut someone up. He was the Alan Bennett of Birkenhead. <laughs> but he also knew the value of actions, and he once had business cards printed that said, Lily Savage, Riot Consultant, Brixton, Toxteth, Los Angeles. <laughs> he would roll his eyes at the use of the word, trail, word trailblazer, but he was. He was born into a very loving working class Irish migrant family in Birkenhead in 1955, and he moved to London and after various jobs, including a peripatetic care officer for Camden Council, in 1978, he created the character of Lily Savage. <laughs> the blonde bombsite, as he called her. <laughs> Inspired by his mother and aunts. A legend at the Vauxhall Tavern for many years. He was, of course, famously on stage during a police raid during the height of the HIV pandemic, the police were wearing rubber gloves due to the misconception that HIV was contracted through touch. Lily said, of course, well, well, it looks like we've got help with the washing up. <laughs> and like Paul, Lily enjoyed a good, a good moan. She once said, I'm sick of fellas, I think I'll become a lesbian. <laughs> At least you get to wear flat shoes. <laughs> After the hard graft, Lily became a star. Television, theater, tours, advertising, pretty poly tights even, of which she said, doing adverts is better than standing at a bus stop, giving someone a ham shank for 15 quid. <laughs> It's a matter of opinion, isn't it? <laughs> but to somehow, to somehow segue from that, from her into a tea time chat show, and then compassionate dog lover without ever losing your edge was an outstanding achievement in itself. <laughs> However, what remained consistent throughout his ascent to megastardom, apart from his brilliance with words, was his sincerity and truthfulness, which are like hen's teeth in the television world, I might add. And of course, his gayness, which was worn like a pashmina. <laughs> Paul put his heart and soul into supporting our community during the HIV epidemic and ever after, be it homophobia, the police, the Tories, animal cruelty, or just overhearing unkind words in the street, Savage would wade in. So, what are Paul O'Grady's great achievements? Rising to the top while remaining true to his roots, his sexuality and his friends, staying at the top 
eclipsing Lily with Paul O'Grady, fighting like a banshee for LGBT rights, fundraising, protesting, speaking for those who didn't have a voice, and any other injustice that he came across. Loved by everyone from gays to grannies, he showed compassion for the underdog and two fingers to oppressive bullies or those who misused their positions of power. Whichever way you look at it, Paul had an amazing action-packed life with so much laughter and so much love. His happy place was a beautiful corner of Kent and his life there with Andre, gossiping in the village shop, moseying around his garden or taking his dogs down the field. It was bliss for him, communing with the sheep and alpacas, conversing with his barn owls, having an afternoon nap in the pigsty with Blanche and Ginger Tom. He was full of stories about witches on the Romney Marsh and ghostly goings on on the Knoll. He'll be out there every full moon, I dare say, letting the air out of the tires of any passing police cars. <laughs> Those who knew Paul were touched by his magic. He could eat and breathe fire literally and metaphorically. But as his friend, what I miss most are the laughs. Paul was the most generous, gifted, gobbiest, and achingly funny man. When I was playing the MC in Cabaret, I was nervous about a final nude scene. Paul said to me, I wouldn't worry. It won't be the first time you've shown your ass in the West End. On my 60th birthday, I got this text message. Dr. Prenner Jones is now doing half price Botox for the over sixes on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> you can get a cheap shampoo and set now, plus a free bus pass. <laughs> and you don't have to pay for prescriptions either. So apart from varicose veins, total apathy when it comes to sex, and the fact you let off even when you have to run for a bus, it's not all bad. <laughs> Have a happy birthday and welcome to the old whores club. <laughs> on the opening night of Panto, he texted me again. To quote you, I hope you're getting a big hand on your opening. <laughs> Although th these days, you'll probably need two to cover it. Paul O'Grady's life was indeed a very, very special achievement. He was a pioneer, a kind and clever friend, and a brilliant entertainer. We should celebrate and applaud him. This award... This award goes to Paul O'Grady, and we are honoured to have Andre Portesio here with us this evening. Andre. Julian, I would like to thank LBG, LGBT Awards for this recognition. I'm sure Paul would be chuffed with it. Um, and I would like to also thank uh, some people that was instrumental during his career. My mother, as I can call her, Joan Mushroom, Wahid Ali, and Brendan Murphy, who was re a real rock to Paul for many years. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Uh, I think it would be silly for me to reiterate what Julian just said. So I'm going to tell you a little story, very short story. Uh, but I think it really highlights who Paul was as a person. Uh, I believe he was in South Africa. And he received a call from the office to say that a family had called and were asking to, for him to speak to this young boy, um, 
he was very ill and he had only a few hours to live. As you can imagine, to speak to someone on the phone that you don't know is a daunting prospect. Someone that is about to die is even more hard. So he had very minutes between recording to make the decision. Paul being Paul, he took on the challenge and he called the guy and said, you know, this is Paul O'Grady, very nice speaking to you. And he went on to say to the guy, you know, you, you know me for my day job, but what you don't know about me is that I also work as the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> And um, he continued to say to this boy, you know, I've spoken to my boss, and tonight is not your night, kiddo. He said, you have so much more to live, to enjoy, and to experience. So anyway, the phone call was ended, and uh, later we found out that the boy stood up, took a shower, had a whole meal, sat down with his family for the whole evening, and a few days later, unfortunately, he died. Um, I've spent 17 years with Paul, and I know the wonderful person that he was, but I think it wasn't until his death, when I received so many letters, that I realized how much he affected, inspired, and touched people. And I think one thing I, I've learned with him, and I hope inspires everyone, is that one must be kind, be generous, but also be yourself. And I hope that's how he will be remembered. Thank you. Thank you.